You are listening to Book Clips, a mini podcast in which authors and narrators do readings from novels. Check out the show notes for the synopsis and buy links for this book. Hello, my name is Kelly Ayton, and I'll be reading from The Sovereign of Sayre. This is the first book of the Mystery of the Makers series released by Regal Crest Enterprises. This multi genre novel is an action adventure royal romance steampunk sci fi where the heroes have psionic powers and a drive to solve the greatest mystery of all. You can find the full description for the novel on both my website and my publisher. For this book clip, I will start reading at Chapter 5. Castellan had only been reading a short time when she was interrupted by the Khanate's senior guardian, Commander Tosh. She looked up at him and immediately knew something was gravely wrong. What is it, Lieutenant Savan? She marked and closed the book, placing it carefully on the low table, then stood and straightened her uniform. He swallowed nervously. Sir, I've had a precog. We need to stop at the next town, but we don't have much time. Immediately concerned, she grilled him for details. What are your channels? Intuition, but lower. Prescience and telesthesia, both average. She thought for precious sex. Do you know what the problem is, or is it not distinct enough yet? He shook his head. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know yet. Castellan held out her hand. If you allow me to touch you, I believe I can see the precog with my telepathy. Do you consent? Sure of her capabilities and strength, he held out his hand. As soon as their skin met, his telesthesia channel unexpectedly opened, and they both saw a hazy image of an island in the middle of a rapidly rising river. Five Psi, children by the size, appeared to be trapped. Lieutenant Savan gasped and pulled his hand away. It's you. You triggered my remote seeing, so you must be the one they need. Rather than answer him, Castellan strode over to the teleo that was mounted on the wall of their lounge. She rang the pilot, and he answered right away, aware that the call was coming from the Conate's segment. Pilot thought, Benir, how may I assist? Castellan waited no time with pleasantries. Pilot Benir, this is Lieutenant Commander Castellan Tosh. We need to make an emergency stop at the next town. Do you know what it's called, and if it's near a river? Yes, sir, the town is called Vesper. It's not a regular stop, so they only have a small platform. The platform is right before we cross the Mir Altak. It's a good thing you called when you did. We're less than ten means out. I'll vote ahead head and let them know we're stopping. Benir out! Feeling a sense of urgency, Castellan jogged down the hall to the Conate's cabin door. She knocked and kept her emotions under tight control. Conate Dracor, we have a situation. There was a sound of shuffling on the other side of the door, then it slid open. Situation? The lieutenant commander nodded, ignoring the flutter of attraction that was as unwelcome as it was inappropriate. Yes, Conate. Savan had a precog, and it seems I am needed in the next town. There are children in danger. Olivia leaned over and grabbed her pistols from the workspace. She slung a satchel across her shoulders, then stepped out of the cabin. No matter the situation, her mother had trained her to never go anywhere unarmed. I assumed you informed the pilot. Yes, but it's not necessary for you to leave the railer, Conate Dracor. You will be better protected by staying here with your shield unit. Bollocks! I am a powerful psi and well-trained in emergency situations. I will be there in case someone needs me. She looked over at Savan. Is this like the rock slide? He nodded. Just as strong? Savan made a face. Stronger, Kane. I hope we are in time for Lieutenant Commander Tosh to help. Olivienne spun her gaze back to Castellan. You? Yes, it seems that my touch prompted an episode of telesthesia immediately after his precog, indicating that I am the one the vision relates to. He was able to see the children on an island in the middle of a rapidly rising river. The precog says a flash flood will occur soon, so we need to get them off that island. The Conate raised an eyebrow to take in the well-built lieutenant commander. Interesting. Olivienne continued to stare for sex longer than shook herself as if she were in a daze. Well, whatever the challenge may be, we won't meet it standing here like a couple of milling gossons. Let's head toward the front of the railer, where the pilot will most likely line up with the platform. If I remember correctly, there was a town on the river right before we crossed the bridge. As soon as she finished speaking, the pilot's voice came over the speaker system, located in every segment of the railer. Attention, citizens, we will be making an emergency stop in five means. Please remain seated and do not exit the railer. Do not fear the emergency is not related to the railer or any of her passengers. We are simply stopping to assist the town. Again, please do not leave the railer and remain in your seats. Castellan, Olivienne, and all but two of the guardians made their way toward the front of the segment as they felt the railer begin to slow. Before they could pass by Castellan's cabin, the door slid open and a sleep-tussled Dr. Shen popped her head out. Tosh, what is going on? Emergency in the next town, Jametta. 
Lieutenant Savan is a precognitive and says they need my help. Jametta looked alarmed, but Castellan. Castellan knew her friend was about to bring up the strange channel, and for whatever reason, Tosh didn't want the others to know. She interrupted the good doctor before she could traipse any further down her line of questioning. Come along if you wish, Jem, but we need to leave now. It only took a few means to make it to the front of the long railer. Their jog through the aisles of each seg was assisted by the fact that citizens were remaining seated just as the pilot had requested. A porter directed them to the door that would line up to the platform, and it was only a few means longer for the railer to eventually slow to a stop. It was raining outside, and two people stood in the middle of the downpour, soaked to the skin, and waiting to meet the departing group. The clouds were so thick that the day was cast into a gloomy haze, despite the afternoon light of the two suns. Of the people waiting, one was a woman of middling rotos and wore an insignia on her cloak, so Castellan addressed her. Our precog says you have a situation with trapped children. The middle-aged woman took in Castellan's rank insignia curiously. Yes, Commander. Five of them took a boat out to the picnic island earlier today, and when the weather kicked up sudden-like, they were unable to come back. Eventually, the parents contacted me, and when we investigated, we found the water impassable. She paused, as if remembering something vital, then held out her hand. My name is Stella Gordy, and I'm the elected town representative. I'm sorry you stopped for nothing. The island has a small shelter, so we figured we'd let them stay the night out there and then retrieve them in the morning once the storm passes and the water slows again. Castellan's hair had wet enough that a lock fell down into her eyes. She took a sec to slick it back off her face, then clasp Representative Gordy's hand in her own. Lieutenant Commander Tosh, and behind me our Royal Sovereign Khanate Dracor, Dr. Jametta Shen, and the Khanate's shield unit. It is Lieutenant Savan who is responsible for this stop. Your plans to wait will not work, since he had a precog of a flash flood coming down from the mountains. I'm afraid your children are not safe where they are. Representative Gordy didn't know which shock to respond to first. The fact that the royal heir was soaking in the rain in front of her, or that danger was at their doorstep. She bowed toward the sovereign. Kane Dracor, it is an honor to meet you. She turned her attention to the man that had accompanied her. He was young and had a similar look about him, so Castellan thought maybe he was Representative Gordy's son. Gavin, take the moto and go round up your papan and the rescue crew, and hurry, have them meet us at the dock. She turned back to their group. If you'll follow me, the dock isn't far from here. She gestured down a path that ran perpendicular to the railer tracks, and nearly twenty yards further down the railer line, there was a bridge that crossed the Mir al Thak. The river wasn't very large, but the bridge itself was quite high, a testament to the fact that spring floods were not that uncommon in the region. The group took off at a fast jog down the slippery path. Castellan glanced at the conate out of the corner of her eye, surprised that the royal was keeping up with no effort. Dr. Shen had no problems, but the Castellan knew that her friend kept up a strict exercise regimen that started back when they served on the east coast of Andara together. Jametta acted as though she were a hundred rotos old with her proper seriousness, but in all actuality they were the same age and had come through academy in the same class. They both went to officer school together, then on to serve in Psy Defense Corps. But when Psy Medic Corps was low on members, they recruited Jametta, and she left with the chance of faster advancement rather than continue along the military track. She had more opportunities and better appointments through Psy Medic Corps as well. About five means after they started out, the path brought the group to a park. Rain and wind lashed at them, soaking Tasha's shirt and causing it to stick to her skin. The dock itself was on floats, another indicator that the river rose up and down with some frequency. Castellan could immediately see why they decided to wait on the rescue. The water was both fast and deep, running from right to left. On top of the hazardous current, there was a lot of debris in the water, including entire trees. Any boat attempting to cross would be on a suicide mission. Olivian was thinking the same thing and turned to the representative of Vesper. Does your town have a high telekinetic or teleporter? Representative Gordy shook her head regretfully. No, our last high channel went off to Academy this past spring. So you have no high channels that could help? The older woman grimaced. I'm sorry, Conate Dracor, but no, we don't. Castellan looked at the Conate curiously. You're a royal, and you mentioned being high psi. What are your channels? Olivian frowned, but listed them off anyway. Awareness, telepathy, pyrokinesis and apportation, and low channel teleportation. I'm afraid none of those could help with this situation. I could wish a million times over for my teleportation channel to be higher, but unfortunately, I can't pour more than a small animal if it's something alive. I'm stuck primarily with the inanimate. Lieutenant Commander Tosh straightened a determined glint in her eye. 
Don't be too sure that your channel is so useless, Connie Dracor. She peered across to the island, driving rain and peating her view. Do you think you could port float vests over to the island? Olivienne gazed out over the tumultuous water. Do you have a spyglass? Castellan pulled one out of her pouch and handed it over. After a few secs of struggling to peer through the wet gloom, the Connate collapsed the device and handed it back to Castellan. She could just make out the shelter on the small island and the huddled children inside. Yes, I could do that. Tosh looked around and spied a boathouse. She removed a pistol holder in her ever-present leather pouch and handed them to Jametta, then addressed the Connate. Come! She broke into a run, knowing that every single sec counted. Seeing her intention, the Connate handed off her own gear to Savan and made haste after her. She was followed closely by her shield guardians. When they reached the boathouse ten yards away, Castellan found it locked. She abruptly pulled up and gave a great kick to the door, splintering it open. Inside, they retrieved the only five float vests stored within. It would do. She handed them one by one to the Connate, and just as fast, Oliviana ported them out to the island. At the same time, Castellan reached out with her mind to make contact with any of the children in the group. She found one mind with the telepathy channel and pushed slightly to make her presence known. The child, a boy on the cusp of puberty, responded, Hello? Do not be frightened. My name is Castellan, and we will get you to safety. But you must put the float vests on just in case the water rises further, okay? Castellan didn't have the empathy channel, but the colliding thoughts in the boy's head indicated relief. Indistinct words like happy, sad, scared, and cold bombarded her through their connection. Thank you, and please hurry. Water is almost to the shelter. We will hurry. Tell me one thing. Is your boat still there? No, the river took it. She pulled out of the connection and turned to the conate as they jogged down to the floating dock. Did you hear? Olivienne nodded. What is your plan? There's only one thing I can do. I'm going to have to go get them. I will levitate across the river to the island with a boat, load them up, and bring them back. The conate looked at Castellan up and down with surprise. You can do all that? Ever the unflappable professional, the lieutenant commander responded with confidence. Of course. I'm a five-channel high sigh. My telekinesis is rated a six. I think I can manage a few kids in a boat. Olivia's eyebrows rose with the commander's words as she and the rest of the group joined them at the edge of the dock. You? You are the hero of Temple Beach? Yes, she is. Why do you ask? Of course, Dr. Shen had only heard the Connate's question, not the preceding conversation. She's going to levitate a boat out to the island to get the kids and bring it back. Jametta looked like she was going to protest, but Castellan held up a hand. This needs to be done, Jem. Damn the consequences. The sense of unease she had been feeling since being on the railer increased, and she knew she had to act. Without another word to the group, she jogged over to the nearest boat that looked like it would hold five kids and cut the line with a knife on her belt. It was the only item she hadn't removed when she stripped her tools and devices. Then, before the river could strip it away from the dock, she lifted the boat into the air. As the boat rose above the river, so too did she. It was harder than she thought it would be. Though her strength had long returned to her depleted channels, using her telekinesis felt a lot like touching a hot brand with an already burnt hand. Castellan's channel throbbed sickly, and pain flared through her temples. Her face was a study in concentration as she went. All the group on the shore could do was watch and wait. Curiosity scratched at the back of Olivienne's mind, and she addressed Dr. Shen. What were you going to say to her when she stopped you? Jametta clenched her fists, knowing exactly how much pain Castellan would be in. Her actions at Temple Beach strained her telekinetic channel yesterday, practically burned it out, and depleted her reserves at the same time. What? Is she insane? If the pain overwhelms her, she'll drop them all. Dr. Shen shook her head. She'll drop herself first, unconscious into the water if need be. We should stand ready, just in case. My name is Kelly Ayton, reading from The Sovereign of Sayre. You have been listening to Book Clips. Check out the show notes for the synopsis and buy links for this book. If you are interested in showcasing your novel, then check out the show notes for more information.